wish you shalom. This is Reverend John Ferret. We're finally in Genesis chapter 4, here in the 15th lesson. And in this lesson, we're going to focus in on a Bible character called Lamech. A very interesting character. He is the great, great, great grandson of Cain. This is the seventh generation of mankind. And there's a specific verse that we're going to be dealing with, with the story of Lamech. And it's in Genesis 4.24. And the Hebrew phrase is Shevim ve Sheva. Shevim ve Sheva. And the literal translation is 70 and sevenfold. Now, in Jesus' day, one thing that we have learned in these previous lessons is that all they had was the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And Jesus spoke Hebrew, not Aramaic. And so when we're hearing Jesus, we're reading his words in the New Testament, we're reading in English that were translated from the Greek and are really coming from the Hebrew. And since the only Bible Jesus had, or really the only Bible that the Jewish people had 2,000 years ago was the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and that the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, were foundational to the Bible at that time, Jesus definitely connects to the Torah many times obviously to teach his truth about the gospel of the kingdom. And he uses the story of Lamech. Matter of fact, it's related to Genesis 4.24 and that Hebrew phrase, Shevim ve Sheva, 70 and sevenfold. But how did he do this? How did Jesus connect to this? How does Jesus use the words of Lamech to actually talk about the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of peace, the gospel of shalom, the gospel of compassion and love? Are you ready? We have got to go see this. Come on, this is the way. Jesus is the way. Just as he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Come, let's go study. Now, also, we're going to read this, and let's see, we're in, um, yeah, Genesis 4, 16 to 24. So let me get back in there. And I'm going to start reading in, um, well, let's start reading in 19. Lamech took himself two wives, so there's the polygamy, the first time it happens in the Torah. The name of the one was Ada, while the name of the other was uh, Tzila. Ada gave birth to Yaval. He was the ancestor of those who live in tents and have cattle. His brother's name was Yuval, and he was the ancestor of all those who play lyre and flute. Tzila gave birth to Tuval Cain, who forged all kinds of tools from brass and iron. And sister of Tuval Cain was Nahama. Lamech said to, and then Lamech said to his wives, now, before I do this, I want to let you know that when God gave Cain the mark, okay, he said, Cain will be revenged sevenfold. Yeah, I think I'm in verse 15. Adonai answered, therefore, whoever kills Cain, Cain will receive vengeance sevenfold. Okay, are you with me? Okay, so that's understandable because this is the seventh generation, counting Adam as number one, and this is what Lamech says to his two wives. Ada and Selah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear what I say. I killed a man for wounding me, a young man who injured me. If Cain will be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. 
Okay? Now, the Hebrew here, now what I want to do is I want to stop here because I want to let you know that when you study ancient Near East cultures, and I'm talking ancient Near, Near East cultures, go back 3,000, go back 4,000, go back 5,000 years and study ancient Near East cultures. What happens is this. When they have something happen to them, okay, bad, they're going to come back at you big time. Now, I'm, I'm going to be a little... In other words, you hurt my son. You broke his thumb. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come and I'm going to break your son's thumb. I'm going to kill all your sheep and I'm going to burn your barn. How about that? Then that guy says, oh, so you're going to... This is what they did. This was the independent way of being able to revenge things that have happened to you. Now, I want to stop here a little bit because I want to, I'll turn to Lebec here in just a second. But I want to come back to you because you have read this. And it's almost, and to me, I, I, for me, it was a readover verse because I didn't understand it. And God, in Exodus 21, 23 through 24, God says, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for a life, right? For us, it's like, yeah, that's wonderful. Big deal. To them, this changed society. This was an amazing, earth-shattering event when all of the societies around them were basically saying, somebody hurts your son thumb, burn his barn. If the guy burns his barn, kill his family and kill all... You see what I'm saying? How it escalates? Here's what God is saying. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Now, what God is not meaning because it never happened that way. God does not mean if somebody pokes your eye out, then you get to poke his eye out. This is what happened. In reality, it would come down to this way. Somebody hurt my son and broke his thumb. So therefore, based upon the fact that they broke his thumb, he can't work well. He can't go to work. He can't earn the income, and it's going to take a while. So what they would do is they would go to the synagogue, and they would go to the local synagogue court, the Bet Dean, three guys, okay, three judges. And they'd ask the judges, okay, here's the situation. And they would assess a penalty for the worth of the thumb. Now they're going to say, we're not going to break your son's thumb, okay. What if he didn't have a son? What if he didn't have a daughter? That's the, okay, what we're going to do is this. They might say, all right, you have to pay for all his hospital expenses. Or you'll have to uh, do this, pay for his hospital expenses, and on top of that, you're going to have to um, pay the boy, okay, the pay that he is not earning because of his broken thumb. This changed society. And you guys, ladies and gentlemen, what's interesting is our judicial system is based upon this. The Judeo-Christian ethic. And part of this, in other words, if you have a crime made, and that's why there's capital punishment. Somebody, this is what God's view of capital punishment. A life is taken purposely, intentionally. Okay, we're going to do that to you. That's Torah law. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Okay? So I want to basically mention to you guys is that... Here it is. What's one of the purposes of this class? One of the purposes, you guys, of this class is to say, how did the Hebrews hear this? when they're coming out of Egypt. And, and then later on, when they're getting the Ten Commandments and they're getting God's instruction through Moses and they see eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, they say, this is amazing. And then God, then God, on top of that, adds to it, remember the six cities? The six cities where a, a person who's committed a murder, maybe an accidental murder, can actually go? That's brand new. Because there was the blood avenger. And in the other pagan societies, those pagan societies, they could go out and kill the guy, whether it was an intentional murder or an accidental murder. They didn't care. Blood is spilt, we're going to get him. But God said, no, he can be protected, and let's bring the case to these people, and let's handle it. This, this is earth-shattering. So the Hebrews are bringing a society with God's law that is just changing everything. It's, it's amazing. So it is explosive. Now let's get back to Lamech. 
Now Lamech, remember, he basically says that Lamech will be uh, avenged. And the actual, the best English is 70 and sevenfold. Some of your translations will say 77. Okay? But here's the Hebrew. Shevim ve sheva. Shevim is 70, ve sheva, sevenfold. That's the actual translation. Now, we have a translation of the Torah in Greek. It's called the Septuagint. So we can now actually go to Genesis 4.24 and read the Greek. For Shevim ve Sheva. Here's the Greek. Hebdome kontakis hepta. Okay? This is the actual Septuagint translation, okay, of Genesis 4.21 in the Greek. Heb dome kontakis hepta. In the Greek, it's 70 times 7. It changed. The Greek can't handle 70 and 7 fold. So it took 70 and 7 fold in Hebrew, and the best it can do in Greek was 70 times 7. And then Peter comes to Jesus and he asks him, how many times should I forgive my brother? And you say, 490. Because he said 70 times 7. He didn't say that. He said it in Greek. The Greek is, hebdome kontakis heptu. It's the same phrase as in the Septuagint. Identical. But Jesus isn't speaking Greek. He's speaking Hebrew. Shevim ve Sheva. He's referring to the Torah. He's referring to Lamech. Seventy and sevenfold. You don't take revenge seventy and sevenfold. You forgive seventy and sevenfold. That's the point. He's trying to use the Lamech story to show us how much we should forgive. Astounding. But that's a rabbi. He's using the Torah. And what we, now, here's the interesting thing, and that's this. Did Jesus really say, Shevim ve Sheva? What we have is, Hebdome kontakis hepta. What we have is 70 times 7. That's what we have. Did Jesus really say, Shevim ve Sheva? Did he really say the same phrase as Lamech? We don't know. Isn't that frustrating? I mean, this is one of those things, please write this down in your notebook, and then when you meet the Lord, uh, and he's going to have a class on the numbers of the Bible, take that class, and you guys ask the question, okay? Because I probably won't take that class, because I have to talk, uh, I've got to go take a class from Paul, okay? On his various uses of the word nomos, law, okay? I've got a real problem there. So you guys do the number stuff. We don't know. So I'm trying to tell you, the Bible does not say that, right? And if any of you come to me and say, Jesus said exactly what Lamech said, I would say you're teaching false. You're, you're, you're not teaching correctly. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible implies it. Are you with me? And that's how we have to teach it. And I think the implication is pretty strong. Okay? I mean, it's pretty strong it, to me. Okay, but we can't say for sure. Oh, I just love this also. When you're reading the Lord's Prayer, let me just do this. This is um, Matthew 6. I'm going to read it from the New American Standard. Matthew 6. You remember the phrase, and it says this, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Okay, now uh, let me read that the English. The English is good uh, from the Greek. And forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Or another one is uh, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, 
In the Greek, when you go into the concept of as is, that means in the same manner. Whoa. Lord, forgive me in the same manner I forgive others. That's heavy. Do you forgive totally? Because you're saying that in the Lord's Prayer every time. Forgive me the way I forgive others. Oh, I hate that guy. Yeah, I forgive him. Really? I'll forgive you in the same way. It's pretty rough. So. Well, we went to the seventh generation of Cain. And, you know, they just, that, that's it. They're never mentioned again. You cannot find the sons of uh, Lamech mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. That's it. I'm not trying to say that they died out. They didn't die out. They probably kept on going. Probably had other sons and daughters and that type of stuff. That's fine. But I want you to recognize the structure of that genealogy. There's no, there's no uh, years, how long they lived. It just gets to seven. That's it. And Lamech at the end does two powerful things. One, polygamy happens for the first time, which is against Genesis, the statement in Genesis by God. And then the second thing is, is that this vengeance thing, which Jesus turns around seemingly, okay, in the New Testament. Now, there's another seventh generation of Seth. So we've got to take a look at this because there's another one. It's a parallel one. So in Genesis 4, 25 through 26, Adam yada chava. So again, he knew his wife. John, do you know your wife? Well, yeah, I know her wife. Her name's Robin. And, okay, she's about 4 foot 11. And she's really pretty. No, do you know her? Okay, remember what no can mean biblically, okay? So he knew his wife and they had Seth. Now what's interesting is, Adam is number one, Seth is number two, Enosh is number three, Kenan is number four, not Canaan, Kenan. Number five is Mahal Laal El, Mahal, <laughs> Mahal Al El, he's five. Then there's Yarid is six, and Enoch is seven. So we come to Enoch, and something really is amazing here for the seventh generation through Seth. His name is Enoch. And Enoch, the Hebrew, from the JPS uh, Torah commentary, they talk about it, that uh, it uh, means initiation, startup, uh, dedication, where you would say, wait a minute, Cain's son was Enoch. His first son. And you would say, yeah, that's the initiation of a new line. The, the human race is continuing. Because, again, when we take a look at the picture, it's like once Abel was done, we just have Cain, and that's it, right? That, that's what we would assume. So in the picture, Cain definitely has uh, sex with his wife. They have a son, and his name is Enoch, the initiator. Okay, the initiator of life continuing, okay? So this is physical life continuing. This is interesting because the rabbis look at this and say, yes, physical life is continuing. And cities are built. Uh, animal husbandry starts. There's music. There's uh, um, all the stuff that's happening. We see society developing right through Cain. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. But then we get to Enoch, and this is Seth's son. And he's got the same name, an initiator a dedication, and so on. So Dr. Sarna says, it seems as if the rabbis picture it as the restoration of something. In Cain's point of view, it's the restoration of life. Okay? We're, we're going to, hey, descendants, we're going to have more, uh, uh, more people on the earth. But what happens with Enoch? Okay? The renewal of walking with God. Because this guy is different than Lamech. Because it says Enoch lived for 365 years and he walked with God. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this right now. I would give you other verses. But one thing you need to do is 
you need to actually study the phrase, walk with God, to understand what it means. I'll give you two places that you can check. Noah, we'll, we'll be coming to him shortly. With Noah, he walked with God. And you can connect it with the phrase, he was the, righteous, he was the most righteous man of his generation. Okay? So, oh, righteousness, walking with God, that seems to be the connection. All we have here is Enoch walked with God. We don't talk about righteousness and so on. Then you can go to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2 talks about the tribe of Levi. He actually talks, God is actually talking through uh, Malachi uh, about Levi, uh, the tribe of Levi, how it originally started. He said, I made a covenant with Levi. I made a promise with him, okay? And with uh, regards to uh, Levi, Levi was supposed to walk with God. Oh, well, that makes sense. They're the priests. They have to be righteous, yes? Because they're the ones that are obviously representing, okay, they're the representatives of bringing the people closer to God. Okay, some of them are priests. So walking with God really has the implication of living right before God, righteous before God. The other thing that I want to bring up is um, when you deal with um, the fact that he was taken, remember that, and all of a sudden God took him? Here's another phrase you need to study because Christians, what I find, make a terrible mistake because they're reading the English. And they immediately associate Enoch with Elijah. And they say, see what happened? God came down and took Enoch and gone. But when you actually study the phrase taken by God, or you actually, that phrase, it means he died. There's a number of places when you study the Torah, the exact phrase in the Hebrew, that it is clear that he died. But the Hebrew implies it was really sudden and unexplained, and he disappeared. And that's all it said. The point being is this. Was it like Elijah that God all of a sudden picked up Enoch and took him away? No, we don't know. So here's one of those things, you guys, when you're actually studying the Bible and reading in English, I hate to say it, you may have wonderful conclusions about Enoch, but you have to say, what does the Torah say? Period. Rabbis love to actually put things that's in between the lines. And there's many pastors who like to do the same thing. I heard one pastor today talking about the Sabbath before we came, and it was amazing, his conclusions. One of the conclusions that he made was, why didn't Jesus ever mention the Sabbath in the entire New Testament? Why didn't he ever say the Sabbath is on the seventh day? Why? It's easy. This is what the pastor said. This is easy because Jesus was going to change it after he died. He was going to change it to Sunday. <laughs> Do you realize that Jesus never kept the Sabbath? It's in the New Testament. On the radio, on Sunday, as part of a sermon today. No names, no churches. Anyway, I just, I wanted to take the radio and throw it through the bathroom window. I couldn't believe, I mean... That you talk about reading in between the lines. Hello, Jesus is Jewish, and he was never accused for breaking the Sabbath. Why? It's a Jewish book written to Jews, not written to you. Okay. Anyway, another aspects of the line of Seth um, that I wanted to add. Let me just see here if this is the way I want to go. No, I'm going to continue on. And I want to go to two things as we are going to end off here tonight in this last five minutes. And I'm going to return to some of this in our next session. But I want to end off with this verse. Actually, two verses, but this verse. And that is Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. As a matter of fact, this is me where I have to end off because I may talk about it too long. 
Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, and I'm reading again from the complete Jewish Bible by Stern. And it says this, here's the genealogy of Adam. On the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. That's it. This is fascinating. In the JPS Torah commentary and other places, you can read about two great rabbis. One of them was Rabbi Akiva, and he lived from 50 A.D. to 137 A.D. And uh, there was a contemporary uh, that he had, a fellow rabbi, Rabbi Simon ben Azai. And these were great rabbis, and obviously I think Rabbi Akiva probably had the lead role here in terms of being probably the most important um, and probably the most listened to. But they came to Rabbi Akiva and said, what's the most important Torah principle? I mean, the most important, the one. And he said, that's simple. This is going to sound like Jesus. Okay? And he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Ah, oh, wow. I don't know what he did to explain himself, but that, according to Rabbi Akiva, is the most important Torah principle. He didn't say the greatest command, uh, second greatest commandment. Jesus said, that's the second greatest commandment. He's the first rabbi that ever said it. Okay? But Akiva's saying it's the most, uh, most important Torah principle, assuming you already love God. So they went to Ben Azai, Simon Ben Azai, and they said, Rabbi Azai, what's the most important Torah principle to you? And he said, uh, very simple. He said, let me read it to you. And he read exactly what I just read. Genesis 5.1. And this is the genealogy of Adam. And what? I, that's a Torah principle? And he said, yes. He said, I don't want to disagree with Rabbi Akiva, who's a great rabbi and who shows us so much out of the Torah. But basically it's this. How do you know who your neighbor is? Unless you know that your neighbor is like every man, because you all have one father. Remember what I read a little bit earlier. Are you your brother's keeper? And in the story of Cain and Abel, there are seven occurrences of the word brother. So therefore, Sarna concluded that what God is probably giving us an indication is homicide is fratricide. Ben Isaiah is saying the same thing. That's amazing. And now we go to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus is teaching already, probably years before Ben Azai, the same thing. Who's your neighbor? The Samaritan. The one you hate the most. So Yeshua basically is saying, as is Ben Hazai, who's your neighbor? Every man, every woman. Because all of us have the same father. Regardless whether they're believers or not. There's no stipulation on that. So I just wanted to share that verse because, again, here is a verse that you just read and how the rabbis may comment on that. Now what I'm going to do is share with you a little bit where we're headed on our next class. It's the flood story. But before the flood story, we have to handle the most puzzling, the most confusing set of verses in the entire Torah. Nobody knows what they mean. Nobody. And if you come to me and tell me I know what it means, you're going to have to write the paper and submit it to Hebrew University because you've got the answer. Really? Nobody can figure out. Everybody has wonderful opinions. So, for example, who are the sons of God and who are the Nephilim? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the rabbis, throw them out, all the pastors and throw them out, all the seminaries, seminaries, throw them out, all of it, throw it all out. 
I'm going to be dealing with history and history only. Period. History. And just as a teaser, this Torah was written and the Hebrews were coming out of Egypt. The main God of the Egyptians during the 18th dynasty, whether it's the early Exodus or the late Exodus, it makes no difference, it's the 18th dynasty. The main God is Amun-Ra. We have hieroglyphics that state Pharaoh is the son of God. In Hebrew, Ben Elohim. Elohim, you say, wait a minute, that's God. No, it isn't. It's one of the words used for God. Elohim also means gods. In the Torah, it also means kings and rulers. We need to go back to history because, ladies and gentlemen, I believe in my own opinion, based upon history and upon references of real historical scholars, that it's very simple. We're going to get rid of all the Jewish mysticism that comes out of the Middle Ages. We're going to get all of this. And we're going to look at history because that's where we need to be. They knew what it meant 3,500 years ago, and it's part of history. And again, this is what we need to do is to return to archaeology, history, customs, culture, the language, to actually try to say, what does the Torah really say? And so once we can figure out what the Torah says, we can really see Yeshua and understand the gospel according to Moses. So in uh, lesson 15 that we just finished, I brought up that pastor I heard on the radio prior to the first time I taught this, and that he said that Jesus did not say anything about the Sabbath, or he did not say anything that the Sabbath was on a Saturday to, in, in the entire New Testament. And so he thinks that he's got to fill in what the Bible does not say. Who's he? <laughs> this is God's Word. And he says it's missing because Jesus wanted to change it from Saturday to Sunday. Th this is so totally absurd. First, the Bible in no way implies that at all, that indeed that the Sabbath is on a different day or it would be on a different day. Second, the Gospels is Jewish literature written to the Jews 2,000 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, these are Jewish books. They're not necessarily meant to be written to us. They're written to them 2,000 years ago, and we need to reconnect to see how they heard it, how they understood it, so we can apply it correctly according to the initial meaning that God really intended. So why would Jesus even bring up the Sabbath? It's not even an issue for Jews 2,000 years ago. On top of that, we read in Luke 4, 16, in English, that as was his custom, the Greek word there is etho. G1486 is the Strong's number, G1486. The Greek word is etho. And when you go into Thayer's Greek lexicon, it's a habit. It's, it's a manner of living. It was what he was accustomed to. <laughs> of course, he's Jewish. What are all religious Jews accustomed to do on the Sabbath, on Saturday, to go to the synagogue? So the Bible says, by Jesus' life, by his actions, that he practiced the Jewish Sabbath which starts on a Friday evening and ends on a Saturday evening. Jesus never says in the New Testament that abortion is murder. Matter of fact, it's nowhere in the entire New Testament. So, using the pastor's logic in misreading the scripture, therefore, since abortion is missing, uh, abortion must be okay because Jesus never condemned it, right? It's, it's not mentioned anywhere. Take a look in the entire New Testament. It's not mentioned anywhere. 
But we know as Christians, this is totally absurd. This is ridiculous. We know abortion is murder. However, when we study Jewish history, when we take a look at the Jewish culture of Jesus' day, it just so happens we have the writings of Josephus. And Josephus was writing shortly after Jesus' day, and he writes in one of his books, one of his documents, that abortion is murder. And therefore, a woman who commits abortion is subject to capital punishment. Now, in the next lesson, we'll be into Genesis chapter 6. We're going to deal with another huge error as related to Genesis 6, verses 1 through 2. In there, we talk about the fact that the sons of God took wives for themselves. And there are many Christians today, oh, I said, oh, that's the fallen angels. Those are spirit beings because they're the sons of God. However, we're dealing with a specific time in history, 3,500 years ago, and when we take a look at the phrase B'nai Elohim, the sons of Elohim, it has four separate ways of translation 3,500 years ago. Why our translators picked the sons of God is a mystery. There are three, actually four. That, well, number one, B'nai Elohim can mean the sons of God. B'nai Elohim can mean the sons of the gods. It can mean the sons of angels and the sons of rulers. Okay. Um, which one did you mean, Moses? The sons of God, the sons of the gods, the sons of angels, the sons of the rulers. We're going to take a look at this. And if one ignores the historical context, it leads to all sorts of misinterpretation and misapplication. So let's go into this. Let's take a look at B'nai Elohim. And let's let the culture, the history, the time period of 3,500 years ago, the fact that they were coming out of Egypt, let that help us perhaps get a more common sense understanding of this phrase, the sons of Elohim, the sons of God, the sons of the gods, the sons of angels, the sons of rulers. So you ready to go deeper into God's word? Come, this is the way. And we'll remember in Luke 24, 50, that Jesus lifted up his hands to bless his 120 disciples before he ascended the Father, just like the high priest daily lifts up his hands. It could very well be that Jesus blessed them with the ironic blessing. I've taken the ironic blessing and I've turned it into a prayer. I'd like to end our session with that blessing. That blessing that's based upon the high priestly blessing that God gave to Moses to Aaron to bless the people. Yevarekeinu Adonai Vishmarkenu, Yair Adonai Panava Alenu, Vekunakenu, Isa Adonai Panava Lenu, Viasem Lanu Shalom, Vishem Yeshua Adonenu, Amen. So together, let's say this in English. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us, and may he give us his shalom. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.